So we've been going through Practically Christian, What Matters, and perhaps my favorite part of the series has been the last Sunday of each month. Uh, we're hearing from one of you, and a testimony or, or a sermon about what God has put on your heart, and we've heard from Amy Evans, and we've heard from Penny Mason, and today we're going to hear from Tommy Evans, and I am sure God has just put something on his heart that is just going to speak to us, and so I'm going to pray for you if I could before we begin that. God, I give you thanks for Tommy and, and his willingness to serve. I give you thanks for the joy that you have placed in his heart. I thank you for the message that you have placed on his heart today. His story is your story, and it matters. And when we share it with other people, you do miraculous things in the hearts of your children. I pray that you will speak through Tommy today, and that you will give us ears to hear the message that you are speaking through him. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Good morning. Good morning. If we could please stand for today's reading. Our reading today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him... He will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about, about words. It is no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And the second reading comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But mark this, there will be a terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of God, life, godliness, but denying its power, having nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who warm, their, who warm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. The word of God for the people of God. I've heard the word lucky several times today. You know, good luck. I feel lucky to be up here. It's a, a great friend of mine told me that uh, he doesn't like to hear the word luck, and uh, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, it's all in his plan, and it's a blessing. Uh, Haley, this morning, what a blessing, not just from her, but also all of our youth here at Hillside. You know, Steve and Sandy, what a blessing. We're so blessed to have you guys and all of our music directors, right? So, hello and good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tommy Evans. I'm 35 years old and I've been married to Amy Evans for 14 years. And we have three daughters, daughters Caliber Evans, 11, Macy Evans, 8, and Billy Evans, 7. I've been attending Hillside off and on since the fall of 2010. My missions here at Hillside consist of Little Friends Club, small group leader, Two Fish, Five Loaves, Missions Board, Second Monday Meal Delivery, Praise Band Drummer, Family Builders, and Donut Bar Cleanup. And that's got to be one of my favorites because there's usually donuts <laughs> left over. With a Say Yes attitude and Amy Evans is my wife, you never can tell what's next on my list. Let me start with saying thank you for all you that are here. And thank you for all those that are home that will be watching later on the second service. Most importantly, thanks be to God for providing me with this place of worship. Without this family, I would never be where I'm at in my walk. But to this day, I continue to fall short, short of what's expected of me by him and by all of you. Even though I fall short, God has provided the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ. 
Emmanuel, Son of God. He has made it clear that I will always fall short of the glory of God, but he makes up the rest. I am forever in debt to him, and only he deserves all the praises that I will ever receive. I'm not saying live life like... I'm sorry. I'm not saying live life like you want and ask for forgiveness on Sunday. How many of us do that? How many of us live life like we want and then don't even go through the effort to ask for forgiveness on Sunday? Guilty. Just putting my message together, still even this morning... Just to make it presentable for you guys, I realize how much I'm failing him. Chris started this sermon, the summer sermon series, What Matters, letting a group of us share our stories. What a great opportunity for the body to share with each other. It's important that I say yes when I'm asked to overcome the nerves of being up here because it's just one more way for me to show him that it's worth it. God allows Jesus to bear my burdens. If my story only affects one person today, it's all worth it. Prior to attending Hillside, in my late 20s, I'd only been to church service maybe two times in my entire life. I wasn't raised in a church, nor did my parents attend church. My aunt in Vincennes was a devout Catholic at the time, and she invited me to go with her. I'd say I was around five or six years old. I'll never forget the feeling after my first church service, and it was Catholic service. I was scared to death. I walk into a new place, lots of people. It's loud, chaotic, people are hugging. I get separated from my aunt. As I'm looking to find her, I see a statue of a man over in the corner, I walk up to it. Here's this man lying, bleeding from his hands, bleeding from his feet. He has whelps on his back and he's bleeding. He's bleeding from his eyes and a woman is holding him crying. And it was his mother Mary, just after he was removed from the cross. Startled, my aunt grabs a hold of me and all the commotion, and we go sit down and listen to the sermon. Between the singing, understanding how the fold-down kneelers work, all the people standing and sitting to read scripture, I'm all kinds of confused. Then it's time for Holy Communion. I didn't get to participate, so I sat by myself. It may not seem like a lot now, but to a five-year-old in a congregation of 300 people, I felt pretty alone. So after that moment, I had no interest in going back to church. So growing up without church, I was raised on the White River. I'm a river rat by heart. I'm the baby of three. So my two older sisters were moved out. My parents trusted me, I had good parents. So hunting, fishing, gardening, and trapping was all I did. It's all I knew. Most of those times, me and my dad would spend that time together. Some of the best times with my dad, there was never a word said sitting in a boat floating on the White River. I'm not sure how I remember, if I remember, but we were fishing one time and he said, uh, I asked him, is God real? Yes. Do we think he's real? Yes. Why don't we go to church? Dad told me firmly, you don't have to go to church to get right with the Lord. And that was that. I, I used that as a little bit of motivation for the rest of my life. He told me, work hard, be honest, and take care of your family. That's all you need. I turned that into one of the very few life goals that I've ever had. So, I got married. At the age of 21, my wife, 18 at the time, graduated from high school on May 28th. While she was having her graduation party, I was busy packing her stuff out to the truck. Literally, as soon as the party was over, we made the hour drive home to our house, and she was mine. On June 14th, just 17 days later, we married in the Methodist Church in Worthington, Indiana. I was always told that the first year was the hardest. I continue to tell myself that. And I'm sure she feels the exact same way. So, we planned our first child. Callie was uh, our plan, we thought. That was something that we made important early in our marriage. So we quickly became pregnant, and at 30 weeks, Callie was born only weighing two pounds, 13 ounces. She was 10 weeks early. Amy would suffer through severe preeclampsia, but recovered quickly. Callie spent six weeks in the NICU at Evansville and I worked that whole time. Amy never left her side. God continues to show his love even though I don't deserve it. During that time, um, God's love went unnoticed. Now I realize how blessed I am, not lucky. 
Two years later, we planned Macy. Everything went as scheduled, C-section. She was a very healthy 10 pound, two pound, 10 pound, two ounce toddler. I'll never forget the first time I seen her, I asked, where's my baby? So with two kids, work's a priority. April 17, 2009, I've been in maintenance for nine years, working hard, night shift. I get laid off, stressed, got two kids, we'll figure it out. I started a new job a month later on May 26th of 2009. Better pay, better insurance, advancement opportunities, more hour opportunities. Two weeks after starting the new job, we found out we were pregnant with our third child. The unplanned one on our list. Macy was only nine months old at the time. Amy had a very sick pregnancy, and I worked all the time, so I was zero support to her. God wasn't in our life. For the next five years, at this new job, I worked almost double shifts the entire time I was there. For those five years, I was promoted three times with a chance for a fourth, and I turned it down because I'd lose money. I worked four different departments and became somebody that multiple people relied on in a multi-million dollar operation. What did I accomplish? I grew apart from my wife. I was disconnected from my kids and more debt. Without a plan, the more you make, the more you spend. For the most part, I'd quit hunting and fishing, so I had lost the only potential spirituality that I had at the time. I had managed to get pneumonia three times during those five years, and on the third time, I developed a blood disorder called ITP. I spent a week in the hospital and missed 28 days of work, but I came out just fine. God's blessings just keep going unnoticed. So I was talking about them goals earlier that Dad gave me. Work hard, be honest, and take care of my family. I wasn't holding up my end of the deal. I worked hard. I worked very hard. And I was proud of it. I was a proud father and husband. And I wasn't afraid to show that because Amy was at home without a job. And I was the provider. I wasn't being honest with my family. I was texting other women while I was at work while I was at home with my family. I would share pictures of myself and receive pictures from other women I would talk to at work. Then on Wednesday nights, Amy was never home. She started coming to Hillside. She had women's groups and she had uh, Wednesday evenings with the youth. So then guess what happens? The next thing I know, I find myself getting home early just so I have alone time. Amy's not there, I can't reach her because she's here tied up. So what do I resort to? I resort to texting those that are feeling that need that I'm not getting. Or I would watch adult videos, things that I absolutely shouldn't be doing. I come to the realization that in the eyes of the Lord, sin is sin. I may have just been texting or watching videos, but in his eyes, it's the same as laying with those women. Lust is a, a real issue for you guys, and it is for me as well. I wasn't taking care of my family coming home after 12 to 20 hour days just to yell at my kids at every little thing and have a violent attitude. I was so hateful to the one person that had been waiting to see me all day. I remember one Sunday morning after working a long week, Amy gets me up to force me to come to church. So I get up, Caleb is blaring in the house, Macy's singing at the top of her lungs. I wasn't where I needed to be. So I walk in and I grab the radio and I throw it across the room and I called Macy a Jesus freak to her face. So now looking back, it is an honor to call all three of my girls a Jesus freak. And I can never tell how sorry I am. So that begins the change for me. Amy joined a 90-day challenge Bible study in January of 015. And she came across a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 16, saying, Don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? Little did I know on Wednesday nights I was being prayed over by a women's connection group. If you remember further back in my story, Wednesday nights was where I was at my worst. Shortly thereafter, God is my witness. I started having dreams. One night I woke up 
in the bedroom and walked over and there's an electrical panel and I stood there and I screamed at the electrical panel Corinthians three times as loud as I could and I have no idea why. I, I could never figure out. I started asking Amy a lot of questions. She couldn't answer them. Little did I know she and the others had been praying for me in this building, outside of this building, via text message. She had just so happily stumbled on that scripture that I just quoted. It wasn't planned. It was, it's his plan. She bought me, soon thereafter, she bought me my first new Bible and held on to it for several weeks. It was to the point to where she was afraid to give it to me. She didn't know how I would react. Didn't know what I would say. It was easy to see that she was scared. We talk about murder and what we think we ought to do with people that murder and do all these bad things. In the eyes of God, I was spiritually murdering my wife at the worst level in the way I see it. I never realized that I too was once a murderer and those are all forgiven by him through Jesus Christ. Because, of, because I was making Amy choose my own faith, her own faith, I was killing her and didn't even know it. I plan to spend the rest of whatever time God has given me loving her to the best of my ability. If you look at Amy's phone right now and you go to her contacts and you look at my number, it don't say Tommy, it don't say hubby, it don't say hot stuff. It says my number two, and it's only because she puts me second to God, and that is what saved our marriage. So I talk about being blessed and not lucky. I'm blessed with God's grace. Right back there on May, May 17, 2015, I was baptized through immersion at the age of 33. Amy stepped in the baptismal, and she got reaffirmed. We then joined hands, and Chris renewed our vows, putting God first in our marriage. But that's where it started getting hard for me. That manly pride, that guilt was eating at me. God knew that I hadn't come fully clean. Amy didn't know all the secrets I had. We talk about guys being manly men, having that pride, man of the house attitude. Well, I was trying my new life, changing old bad habits, studying the Word, doing devotionals daily, going to church because I wanted to, not because I was forced. The guilt was taking over my life. Me and Amy had an adult weekend away, no kids. I couldn't fulfill our relationship needs that weekend because of the guilt that was going on because I hadn't come clean to her. She knew something was up, but she held on to it. <coughs> While we were away that weekend, we were in the Jasper area, so we decided to attend a church over there that some of our friends go to. That day they served communion. We sat in the front row, because we're front row people. And I took a piece of the bread, and they had the little tabs with the drink, and I took a piece of bread, and I throw it back, and I take the drink, and the piece of bread lodges in the back of my throat. And I was like, it's okay, the juice will, the juice will wash it down. Take it down, it's still there. So, okay, don't panic. Give me a minute, it'll pass. I stood there thinking in the front row of that church, God is going to choke me out right now in the front row, right here in front of everybody. And I got to thinking, and the song's playing, and I got to thinking, I need to swallow my pride. I need to bite the bullet and come clean with Amy wholeheartedly. As soon as that thought crossed my mind, it immediately passed without me even swallowing. Music's still going on. I'm crying. I got goosebumps. I'm seeing spots from not breathing. I run up to the front while the music's still going on. Their associate pastor's standing there, and I told him everything that just happened. He was in awe, especially for somebody that just attended their church the first time. I didn't say anything to Amy as I walked up there, and she was trying to figure out what was going on. A couple days later, I came completely clean. It was the best thing I could have ever done. I broke her heart. It took a couple of days and a whole lot of prayer between me and her and shared prayer with me and her. She has now forgiven me. And I pray that I'm forgiven with him. 
Thanks to Jesus for taking those burdens, for setting me free. I don't walk around with that guilt that kept us separated for so long. Since then, I've found a lot of enjoyment in reaching out to others that are having a hard time, non-believers, and those that need prayers but don't ask. God is growing me by reaching out to others. I have old friends that I've reached out to. I share a scripture, share, share a devotional, and I get so much enjoyment out of that. I've been blessed to witness a good friend, a brother in Christ, to get baptized in this building and to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit just to watch him grow and spread the word and love of God. All it took was a few seconds of my time every day. A quick text message, a quick email, a smiley face. I owe some people some apologies. I was attending this church when Brian Cook left, and it was sad to see him go. I always liked his messages. I was nowhere near where I should have been in my faith whenever talks of a new pastor were going on. Amy told me the new guy was divorced and had kids and remarried. Of course, me having this better than now attitude, not being where I was in my faith, I drug Chris's name through the mud. What is a divorced man with kids going to do for me that's married and I provide for my family? How judgmental and selfish of me to feel that way, and I'm truly sorry. You are uh, one of the tools in my life that God has provided. All the Hillside staff is. Thank you for everything that you are and everything that you do for me and my family. I also think it's easy to forget how much a pastor's wife has to carry on her shoulders. I just wanted to say I'm sorry, and now you know what you really mean to us. In conclusion, I mentioned goals a couple times already, and as you can guess, my goals have changed. I still plan to work hard, maybe not as hard, be honest and take care of my family, but my priorities have changed. One day during some study time, God kept giving me the word desire. And all I could think of was desire. I'm going back to my old ways of lust. That's not the word I want to see. But then he gave me another word, undesire. And I got to looking. He got me thinking about the love of others and who is the hardest to love, the undesirable people. Ones who we call, who call Christians hypocrites. The ones who hurt people. The bad dad that lies to his wife that's forced to go to church. That guy I've been talking about the last 15 minutes. God's plan put me at Hillside for a reason, and I believe wholeheartedly now that I desire to inspire the undesirable. Think about that for a second. I desire to inspire the undesirable. What does that mean? It means I plan to pour myself into the undesirables around me and to any of those that I can, brothers and sisters that are just like me, broken and lost, who continue to fall short of God's glory. So Hillside, thank you. The Evans family loves you. And God bless you.